court of battle, uh, edged weapons are a force to be dealt with and to be respected. something I'm going to learn overnight. So you have to take in a, and look at a style and say, well, what are these tools that I need and, and what fits me best? And what kind of style fighter am I? One of the things uh, that is, is important to me is, and uh, it, this has come about after training a lot of different groups and uh, SWAT teams, working with SEAL team obviously, uh, individual law enforcement officers, is that there's a general, there, there can be a general lack of awareness when it comes to edged weapons. Uh, people don't realize how quickly they can be deployed, how damaging they can be, and that they are extremely hazardous. If you task me or any SEAL uh, the mission of develop a knife fighting uh, technique that SEAL team can use, well, you, ha you take and you go out there and you look at what SEAL team does. We get the best parachutes out there. We train our people to be some of the best in the world. That's our mission. That's our goal and our objective. If I'm going to train these guys to be the best in the world at uh, at jumping and diving and, and doing what their job, if you tell me go out there and get a knife fighting technique, well, then I'm going to go out there and find out some of the best techniques that are available in the world. Now, that's going to take some time, it's going to take some research, but that's, that's what I'm going to do. In keeping with our basic principles and strategy, using an edged weapon is little different from a, for us than using our empty hand. This is an edge weapon art. That's where all the empty hand techniques came from. So we're going to be concerned with ourselves to begin with. Breath control, relaxation, skeletal alignment, the gaze, how we use our eyes. And that determines how we access our mind. We want subconscious mind, absolutely. Conscious mind cannot handle the variables or the rapidity of, t of events that take place. So it's really important that we pay attention to ourselves. Most attacks are variations of these three. A thrust, a stab, a slash. Okay. Most attacks are going to be a variation of that. So this gives you an idea how we're accessing the principles. And it gives us some basic technical format where we can train. So what we do is we go out there and we find out what techniques work. Now it's real important to say, well, yeah, that's a good technique. It looks good in the studio, but let's get it out there and let's get in a, in a practical situation and let's use these techniques and start polishing them up, find out what techniques work. The SEAL individual at that point, he gets himself a basic technique, these basic techniques that he now can employ. Now if he wants to advance himself further in these areas, then he's free to do that and get better as a knife fighter. Distance is extremely important. I'm not comfortable here. He can reach me too easily without any gross body, body movements. Back up a little bit. Son. Okay. So I need to pay a great deal of attention to how far away from me he is. So it doesn't matter um, what the weapon, there's a distance for every weapon. The knife happens to be one. Stick would be another. His pistol is another yet again. My timing is crucial. The Aiki aspect of this art means that we have to, in our calmness and in our accessing subconscious mind state through proper use of our eyes, start to become in harmony with the movement of the other person and their breathing. These are things we need to understand and pick up.
It's difficult at first, but if you practice that way, you'll start getting a little bit of a feeling for it. The worst thing is to be totally out of harmony with that other individual. His movements seem sudden, they come out of nowhere, you're surprised, you're not, you're not out of the way when you need to be out of the way. This is bad when he has an edge weapon or a stick or a gun. So I need to be relaxed and calm. I need to understand my distance. I need to keep skeletal relationship in mind at all times. We cannot get out here and concentrate on the weapon to the exclusion of all else, okay? He could strike, he could kick, he could access another weapon, he could stick a finger in my eye, he could grab me by the hair and throw me down. It's bad to get fixated on a weapon. You have to be aware of it, but you have to be aware of it working from the center of him out. The other thing that becomes very difficult, those of you who have seen good Filipino knife fighters most especially, that thing is moving fast. And if you think with your eye you're going to follow that blade movement, I think you're going to be shedding blood. One thing I've learned in the past several years is the effectiveness, effectiveness of a knife or a bladed or edged weapon. Uh, as an aggressor, I will use an edged weapon a lot of times, and it's absolutely amazing to me how effective an edged weapon is. One of them is I can conceal the thing. I can just literally be hiding. I can give, your, I can give you the impression that I'm totally harmless. They don't see a gun. They just see me sitting there, and I don't have anything. That, the problem I have is I can employ that. As soon as you get near me, I know that I can employ that edge weapon on you, and this does a lot of damage. And a lot of times, what's really scary about an edge weapon is I can do silent damage to somebody. Uh, there are, I've been in situations where room entries have gone down. I've just been in, in, just put myself around the corner. And as that entry goes down, I will, the first people go in the room, they're going into their sectors to cover their sectors. And next thing you know, I've got myself, my security member, and I'm taking him and using an edge weapon against him. He's out of the situation. Well, the problem is nobody heard anything. I've just silently removed this member from that team. Silent, very silent and very deadly. Now I can either access his weapon or continue with that edge weapon and uh, use it against other members that are coming into the room. Uh, it's a very effective tool. It scares me how dangerous that edge weapon is in those circumstances. So it's very important for me to study the effectiveness of an edge weapon. weapon. There are times when my gun may be down. Uh, one thing that SEALs do is, is we have an E&E &E, uh, uh, mission. Part of our mission profile is if we get compromised in an operation and I have to dump my gear and dump my weapon or I'm, I'm literally running for my life. We've engaged the bad guys are all over the place and we are literally running for our lives. And that's an E&E &E plan that we have on every mission that we have. And I may end up with just a knife and I need to know how to employ that knife. I need to ha know how to use it in a, in a situation where I may be, that's the, the weapon of choice. I may not want to make a big noise here. I may have to employ the edged weapon in a way that is tactically to my advantage at that point. Uh, and so I need to study this style. I need to understand who does it best out there and then learn some basic techniques that are going to help me in my job. He has a weapon. He seems prepared to use it. I don't have a weapon. If I'm playing a game like this, and I'm, I'm showing a threatening uh, aspect to him, he may be a little more cautious and a little more, uh, a little more careful when he comes in. He may not give me a, a, a really committed main body cavity attack. I'm not going to get much of a chance at this. If he comes in whittling, his, whittling away his fingers and toes, this could get to be a real difficult situation for me. So I need to strategically give him something. Okay, you have to be willing to give to get here. So I need to strategically give him something. The easier he feels it is to get a main body cavity attack here, the better off he's going to be. The other thing that I really disagree with is sticking arms and hands out to try to deal with the knife. 
or feet at the knife. If he's properly trained, you've just given him exactly what he wants. He's going to start damaging the corners. He's going to start cutting you up from outside. You can't afford to do that. I need to keep my hands close to my body so that when he does make a committed attack, I have something I can use to counter it. I don't want to be a castle. That means that I'm not going to stand here, even with my hands back, and try to push that knife away from my body, okay, all by itself. One of the things I'm going to do, and we do a lot of displacement, <clears throat> is as he approaches and stabs here, I am going to move my body out of the way. Now, I have to be very careful how I do this. If I just I moved my body, it wasn't out of the way. I have to be very careful how I do this. So we use displacement type turns by moving from the center and realigning our skeleton in relation to his skeleton and of course in relation to the attack. At this point by releasing my knee ankle hip I'm actually displacing out of the way here. Just got to cut my uh, gi top, no big deal. I also don't want to move away from the knife. I want to stay close to the knife. Once I get close to this knife it's got to be a piece of me. I see some videos, Cote Geche, people are out here, this reverse wrist lock, and they're holding it out away from them. Okay? And they're, they're spinning around trying to throw someone doing this. This is bad. If he pops me with his other hand real hard, he can get that loose. Where's that knife? Okay. It's all over the place with power to do something. Once I get it close, by whatever means, this knife is my, part of me now, and his arm is part of me. And I cannot let this go again. Once I make that contact, once I'm close, it has to stay close. So in this particular scenario, not only am I going to remove my body from the attack, area of attack, but I'm also going to redirect. Many ways of redirecting. If he stabs straight here, I could reach down this way. Okay? That's called a cam. Cam's him away. I'm not knocking him away. I'm reaching down. Remember the base of the triangle, legs of the triangle. As he's passing down here, he is already moving at an angle. His whole body is moving. The power is generated at an angle. doesn't matter how much he wants to make it linear, it cannot be. People aren't put together that way. So as he does this, if I blend with that angle, I can redirect that. I can redirect that. That's, this is just one particular way of redirecting. Once I've redirected it, I'm going to come close. I'm going to make him a piece of me, okay? Knock the wind out of him, cause other serious grief here, okay? Timing, of course, is essential here. So, if I'm going to take this particular strategy, this paradigm at looking at combat, I need to understand that his timing is the defining timing. His attack timing is the defining timing. The first thing I need to do is be in harmony with his movement, his speed, his position. I can lead that, but only after I'm in timing with it. So as he's attacking here, I need to be in timing with that. A little different situation this time. He's connected to me. The knife is secure at this point in time. He's triangulated. Knife's at his throat, his arm is locked. There's no difference between attack and defense. They are the same thing. Our defense is our attack, and our attack is our defense. But we tend to, and the, and the basic principles of this art adhere to, having the other person show their hand first, having them attack first, being a counter puncher. This doesn't mean that you can be defensive. You can't take on a defensive. If you're defensive in a lethal force engagement, the chances of you surviving it are slim. So, in my defense is also my attack. Okay? The defense of moving my body out of the way, slow motion please. Redirecting, making him a piece of me, 
That's my defense, but it's also my attack. They become the same thing. If I don't choose to throw them, if there's another situation here, I can use a knife against him. Okay? I can remove it from his grasp. I can place him down. Cut his throat. So, in this beginning, or introduction to knife defense, and also the use of the knife uh, itself in defense, we'll basically handle three attacks. The first one we've just seen, straight thrust of the middle bo the body cavity or even the throat. The next one we'll deal with, Eric, please, knife, is the stab. Okay, overhand stabbing motion. Probably one of the most common attacks, especially by unskilled people. A very threatening attack to deal with initially because as he raises it and that knife's presented, mentally it's hard to deal with. It's even more aggressive to you mentally. Being calm <clears throat> and having the ability to keep your mind calm under all of this is why you need to train. Calm mind, an aware mind, a sensitive mind, that's what allows you to deal with these types of attacks. If you rush in and start banging out of fear and grabbing and butting, and he's going to win this battle because he has a knife and it can rend you in a horrific manner in a short period of time. So, understanding that, his shoulders are the base of a triangle. Whatever he reaches towards me is the leg of a triangle. The point that he wants to make contact with on me is the apex of a triangle. I'm going to cam or redirect. He starts his downward stab. I reach up the leg of the triangle. Okay. This is a cam. This allows him to push himself away from me. And we do a lot of allowing the person. In the presence of physics, he will move himself if he creates that energy and if he's cammed away properly. In one of our training evolutions, we uh, did a situation where we had a uh, security team. I think it was either eight or ten personnel that was in the security team. They had taken Ken and I. We were the, basically the, the aggressors on this particular situation. And uh, both of us were armed with just a knife. All the, the security members were armed with semi-automatic uh, type training weapons. Um, in the engagement, what happened is Ken basically got the focus. He got into a confrontation with one of the uh, security members. In the process, while he was doing that, their, their focus was now fixed on Ken, which allowed me to start using my edge weapon on my particular individual. Now, what happened as the, the event went down, Ken was involved with one of the, the uh, security members. He was pulling him in, starting to use him as a shield, but he was also knifing him at the same time. When their focus switched to him, one of the cover men literally came in front of me. The next thing you know, I have his gun. I'm using edge weapon on him. Well, the problem was all their focus was still on Ken. Mine was very quietly doing, basically eliminating the security member that was with me. At that point, I, st I still had this human shield. When I realized nobody was paying attention to me, I was able to take his weapon. And at that point, I was employing the weapon. Once I started employing the weapon, all of a sudden, the security members started hearing noise. They started looking at me, and I started moving into the room trying to find cover because now there's members trying to shoot me, which opened the door for Ken. Ken slid down the room away from me. Everybody's focused on me. Next thing I know, Ken's sliding down the other side of the room using his edge weapon, removing uh, two or three of their members, which enabled him also to get a gun. At that point, the remaining members that were left alive, we just got them in a crossfire. It was all over. And it happened probably in about a 15 second period. So within a 15 second time frame, 10 armed men attacking two men with edged weapons were, were eliminated in about a 15 second period. Um, simply because they made simple mistakes. Target fixation, mindset. Our mindset was we were just attacking. And all we did is use principles of attack and uh, paying attention to my partner. He was aware of me at all times. I was aware of him at all times. And that's that link that you have that that you have with your partner. We're going to use a knife, blade out, run along the forearm, held primarily with the bottom two fingers, with the top, with the index finger on top. Let's always know where the cut is. 
and it's very effective. If I need to stab, I need to have some way of keeping this from sliding out. Okay. Same situation. Calm, breathing, gaze. Okay. At that point, he has two cuts on the arm, one cut across the neck, and I still have control of his body. I may want to come back over here, regain more control of the center with another lethal cut. Obviously, this is for you guys, naval special warfare primarily. Happens very quickly in slow motion. As he comes in, cut, cut, cut. Takes it all. Take the knife, thumb and index finger, I turn it all the time controlling him. The shock to his system and his arm, my goal here is, once he attacks with that arm, he never gets that arm back, at least not in serviceable condition. So as he's coming in, the redirection also takes his balance. See his balance come forward. Cut, cut, cut. At this point, I could make a choice to throw. And also retain his knife. From a slash to the side. Slow motion. As he begins to slash, I meet it. Same way I did before. Only instead of two hands, he now has a knife cutting just above the elbow is my preference because of the damage that it does and makes the arm more inoperable. I then have a choice of coming back across the top, taking the arm down, controlling him here, stab, Cut. Again, moderate speed. Okay, combative situation. This is a good scenario. He cuts. I move away. Cut under the arm. Back across the throat. Stab just behind the clavicle. Lots of goodies down there before you get to the lungs. May step. Displace. Remove the weapon. Even if he is in the process of dying, I need to be careful of this. That knife could still be flailing around. And as he's falling, it's even more important to be careful because the femoral artery is a large one. Okay. Death throes can be violent. If it moves strong enough, he could cut me deeply, even if he's virtually dead in the process. From the overhand stab attack, I do exactly the same thing. I'm covering a little more, but let's do it in slow motion, right up the triangle. The process of him driving through is he cuts himself seriously on my knife in the process. Okay, we'll do this a little quicker with a little more. Okay. You have two cuts there, one on the back side of his arm, one on the near side of his throat. At this point, my arm's up, keeps the Arteries from spraying in my face. If I want to take a less lethal approach to this situation, okay, again, I have control. I can arm bar, I can dislocate his elbow, I can remove the knife, okay, I can choke him. The, the benefits or the reason why a naval special warfare operator would want to study the principles of knife fighting is that number one, we carry a knife. Uh, there are certain situations where, although rare, a knife would need to be employed. A primary weapon goes down. I, have, I would have a, a, some kind of long gun. I'm in a close quarter battle situation. That weapon goes down, and I need, and I need immediate access to an expedient weapon, and a knife is, is certainly a lethal weapon, and, and uh, I can employ that. <laughs> The other side of it is if I know uh, the principles of knife fighting and I'm dealing with someone that is uh, attacking me with a knife, I, I need to understand what his strategies are, what he's attempting to do, and what the, basically what the threat level is at that point. In order to defend against a knife fighter, you first have to become a knife fighter. A lot of knife defense uh, teach 
is they'll show you from a really straightforward uh, attack theoretically how to defend against it, such as with your knife, come with an overhead thrust, some styles, teach something like this or some variation on it. If that's how someone's going to attack you, you're in great shape to get that technique down. Someone comes with a slash from the outside, do something like that. If you don't miss, you're still in great shape. Well, if someone doesn't attack you like that, which is a pretty poor way to do it, you're in bad shape. So if I come with an overhead block, just do something. You've got one movement. If I come in a straight slash, and again, Barry's already had some training. Again, very traditional attacks, a fairly easy way to defend against it. If you can do that, there's no, there's real, no challenge to that. The idea is you want to be able to counter to some degree. When someone comes in with this sort of attack, okay, you want to be able to deal with that. Someone starts coming in with even something of this sort. Okay, the second principle we're going to deal with is remove the fang of the snake. Very simply, what that means, he has a weapon of some sort. The actual weapon does not make a vast amount of difference. Once you identify the weapon, you identify the characteristics, you deal with the specific characteristics of that weapon, your, your techniques really aren't going to vary uh, very much. So I know if he has an edged weapon, he's got a knife roughly six inches on the blade uh, that defines the characteristics. One characteristic it, it defines is range. I'm in good shape out here and probably in real good shape in here. If I stand right in this distance, I'm in trouble. So one characteristic is a distance. I know it's, a, it's an edged weapon. I don't know if it's single edge or double edge. It really doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, as compared to if that was a gun, which we'll deal with a little bit later, slightly different characteristics. Or even if it's an empty hand, I know the range. I know some of the characteristics of an empty hand. It's not going to be a projectile weapon. Whatever the weapon is, I want to remove that weapon from his arsenal very first thing, or as close to the first thing as possible. So again, that's the fang of the snake. You take that fang away. I'll demonstrate that, then we'll, we'll try this. He attacks with the knife. My first move is to take that knife away. I do that. My motion is a cutting motion. I'm going for the inside of the arm, which is a primary target. It's soft. There's very little uh, coverings, tendons, or ligaments to cover up the vital parts of the arm. I'm going to cut the arm, take that arm out of the fight as much as possible. I don't need to take it out for a long time. I've got him trapped. I may have cut the flexor muscles on the inside of the arm. I may have cut a radial artery, which will cause him to uh, bleed to unconsciousness in 30 seconds. If the flexor muscles and nerves are cut, he's not going to be able to bend that wrist at all. At this point, I'm only going to need a second, but I've got his targets in the back wide open. I've got targets here open. Angles of attack are very critical. Most people think on two planes, straight uh, vertical plane, and the thrust is either going to be coming straight down. In some cases, or not that often, it might be coming straight up or very often straight ahead. It's probably the easiest plane for him to deal with, as Barry was just doing. All he has to do is deflect slightly. The other plane, a horizontal plane, usually about chest high. If I'm coming straight across from either side, there's not a lot of variety. It's fairly easy for him to deal with. As a knife fighter, what you want to learn to attack with and to defend against is multiple angles. So what we'll work with is a basic star pattern where, if you just stand still, as a target, I want to use a horizontal plane. I've got one cut straight across, horizontal, the uh, vertical plane, I'm going to straight down, straight back up. I've got two sides of the X slashing across. I can come back up the straight line. I've got the other side, left side of the X and a straight thrust. So using just those lines, if using your partner as a training target, and just practice, develop your strikes. Now you can vary all of those angles with, with finer detail. If he has a vest on, obviously cutting across his vest is not going to do any good. If he's, however, is attacking with that arm in some respect, I just bring that angle out or down slightly. It's still the exact same angle. I take the arm out. Or if I, it, my level of force is such that I need to finish this fight and, and a uh, deadly level of force is justified, I just change my angle slightly and come into the throat. Same thing if I'm going lower, cutting to the center part of the body may not make a lot of sense. I just change my height to the same lines, the femoral artery on the inside of the leg, cause a pump person to pump out uh, blood loss and possibly lose consciousness or anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds if you cut deeply enough. Additional has a psychological factor. 
of they're trying to move around on a floor covered with blood. We have two basic types of targets. One is a structural or a functional target, and I'll, I'm going to define this for you in a, in a little bit. The other are systemic or sometimes called vascular targets. The systemic or vascular are uh, essentially your blood system or major organ systems of the body. Very often attacking these targets is going to be lethal. Problem with that is, however, I may thrust into the abdominal area, cut the intestines while I'm going in. He's probably going to die of peritonitis or some sort of general sy systemic infection when his bowels are cut, go into the general system, but he's probably not going to die for a couple of days. That's not going to help me in this fight. Uh, I may cut a major vein uh, in some part of the body, and it may take him you know, a minute or two minutes while he's losing blood and losing consciousness. During that minute or two, if he's a superior fighter, I do not want this to be a fair fight. Structural or functional targets, on the other hand, by definition, affect the, the functioning of the body or the structure of the body immediately. In some respects, are more simplistic um, and generally require a lower level of force. You can go on to a higher level of force afterwards, but initially require a lower level. Example would be, if he thrusts a knife straight out at me, we talked about before, you want to remove the fang of the snake, take the knife out. Now, one of the things I'm doing, one, I'm just trying to check the knife. What I'm also doing, expose the arm a little bit more, We've got my first stop or attack was the bones of the wrist. The wrist is composed of small bones, a hard strike with a knife, or I may strike with a knife to stop them, check, smash with the butt of the knife and break or damage uh, the bones of the wrist. It's very painful, it's distracting, which is also a big benefit for you because as he's saying, that hurts an awful lot. That allows you to take the knife out potentially if you're gonna come in with something more lethal, you can do that. What it also does, all the veins, tendons, and ligaments, as well as the nerves of the hand, in order to get to the hand, have to run through the lit, wrist. When I strike the wrist, if I can damage the wrist, I'm also potentially damaging all the, uh, the nerves, tendons, and ligaments. If I can damage that, I can stop the ability to use that hand entirely. The hand goes limp or it locks out or it locks closed, can't use it any further. Also have the, the weapons in the other hand. Let's say if I do get a knife thrust, I might have this arm checked you can still thrust with the other arm or strike with the other arm. Okay, we just went through what the lower arm targets are. I can stop his attack, the bicep. One, there are a fair number of uh, blood vessels going through the bicep. They said that's a vascular or systemic target. That may take a while to bleed. If I get a deep enough cut or cut off the origin, the anchor point of the muscle, that arm is useless. He, he, that arm will drop down. He won't be able to lift it up. Is it lethal? No but it will stop the use of the arm. If the person kicks at you, some styles of martial arts do, because they don't teach offensive knife fighting, will suggest kicking a knife out. He goes to kick, he's giving me a target. There's no reason I should go to the body. He's giving me the large muscle. Again, if I can get a good cut there, that when I'll let him step down. When he puts weight on that leg, he's gonna discover that it's not there. The legs, because they're the largest muscles in the body, have the largest blood flow to them. So when you get a good cut on the leg, you're gonna have very strong force of blood pumping out of whatever you've cut. If I cause him to chase me at that point, he's gonna fall over from loss of blood before I have to do anything else. So it can be functional. It's also a systemic or vascular attack to the leg. If he tries a kick like that again, depending upon how my knife is held, I've got the uh, tendons in the back of the knee that cut very easily. I'll, I'll gladly trade a kick for one attack with a knife. I can thrust in here can cut the Achilles tendon, which will uh, destabilize the leg. The popliteal nerves on the outside of the ankle can get cut, and they're heavy bleeders. If he does a front kick or a side kick, I can do the same thing. I'll absorb the kick. I'm going to get the knife cutting some part of his leg. He then loses his ability to stand. He loses his mobility. Uh, I can get away from him if I need to, if that's tactically appropriate, or it certainly turns a uh, fight into my favor. You can go to the body, however, uh, if you end up there, if you end up close. The targets in the body generally tend not to be as functional or structural as the extremities we just talked about. If he attacks in some respect, if I end up inside close, where generally I want to be checking his knife hand, I can thrust in, as I mentioned before, if I go into the abdomen or intestines, you know, he's going to die a day or two later. That doesn't help me. So I go to the liver, kidney, or spleen, and kidneys particularly from behind. Whether or not he's going to go into immediate shock is kind of up in the air. Uh, he'll probably die from it, from internal bleeding. It doesn't help me a whole lot. I can 
potentially get into the rib cage. It's very tricky unless you have a very powerful knife, very powerful thrust. The ribs run at generally a 45 degree angle, so you have to come into the right angle. The knife can deflect out. Even if I do get in, if I only get one lung, that lung collapses, may start filling up with blood. He can still operate on a second lung. It doesn't do me a lot of good unless I take both lungs. You can potentially get to the heart from underneath, aiming up to a shoulder. Uh, it's probably you know, fairly difficult. There are some major uh, aorta and vena cava uh, uh, blood vessels that run through the body that are not too deep. Again, it can be somewhat difficult to get to. If you're there, it doesn't hurt to use that target. If you're here, thrusting in, using something else at that point would make sense. As I mentioned before, you want to flow with your attacks. You would never use one attack and stand there and say, well, is he going down? He's too close. He still has a knife in his hand. If I do end up with a, a, fun a systemic target here, we talked about the angles. We talked about going from a thrust to a slash. I want to get a couple other slash or techniques in until I know he's no longer a risk. The throat is probably the primary target to stop someone. It's both functional <clears throat> and systemic or vascular. Cut to the throat, he's got about three seconds before he's going to pump out as the expression goes. He's going to drop from uh, loss of blood and loss of oxygen to the brain as well as when you cut carotid arteries, carotid veins, and the carotid nerves, it actually paralyzes the heart. Uh, and that's probably the highest level of force you're going to get to apply. If someone's wearing a vest, in most cases, that area is unprotected. Depending upon your uh, tactical objective and what the situation calls for, Nexa is an ideal target. It's, there are not many wounding attacks on the neck. One other target on the neck, uh, again, if he attacks, if I end up inside, thrusting straight in, going for the thyroid uh, area, it's very heavily uh, vesseled with blood vessels, a cut there will tend to bleed someone out very, very quickly and they'll pass out again in several seconds very often or start losing it within uh, several seconds just from blood loss. So it's functional from the point of view you'll stop them very quickly. Cutting the windpipe as you see in the movies a lot is this will not take someone out as quickly as the thyroid area and the, uh, the carotid. Going to the skull is difficult uh, with a knife and again you're talking about very high levels of lethality if that's operationally called for. You would get in the same way if I'm inside uh, I probably wouldn't want to go straight to the head. He's going to pull it back. I probably want to hit some other targets, get his attention. If I was going to go into the head area, essentially what you have to do is get to the brain. The brain's the control center of everything. If you stop the brain, you stop the attack. The way to get to the brain, the inside of it, the mouth is open inside the mouth and up through the navel cas uh, cavity, through the eye. That's pretty much it. Some people talk about going through the ear. You can't get through the ear very readily. They're not pleasant targets, and you're talking about your highest level of force. Very easy to miss. You hit a bone, you, you bounce off. Probably not targets you want to go for. Uh, one of the important issues of studying knife fighting, it really needs to be understood, is that uh, in order to defend or even deal in an environment where edge weapons could be deployed, I need to understand the strategies of of uh, am I going to be defensive, offensive, or offensive, defensive, or am I going to be passive? Am I going to be uh, very aggressive? Uh, these kinds of things I need to make decisions on. I need to understand what's happening with these things. There's a lot of different techniques, a lot of different applications. And because I'm in a high threat environment, I need to understand that. It's critical that you be able to defend yourself with other weapons against a knife. You may not always have a knife, your primary, your secondary weapon may be down, or you may have to use your primary weapon if it's a long gun. Uh, without being able to fire it for some reason. You know, we talk about distance, it's, it's of critical importance. Same concept, he has to get to my body if he's trying to attack. I therefore, I now have a longer weapon, whether you have a straight baton, uh, your rifle that's no longer functional, a PR-24, anything of that sort. You want to use the effective distance. Now, this is not a really good trade-off. I can reach his body, but he can probably reach my body. Same concept of target selection defining the characteristics of my weapon. This is a longer weapon than a knife, so I have a little more distance. If, I wanna, if he attacks me, I want to stay out of his range. Same thing, I don't want, don't want to go in here, bad trade-off. So as he would attack me, I'd smash his hand as a start, uh, taking up a target. So I might smash on this side, as we talked about, the various small bones in the hand and knuckles. I can smash just on the forearm to shock it. Then I might close the distance. And at this point, I can use the butt of the stick. Same concept we talked about with the knife. I can be striking here and still be thrusting with the stick. 
I can go into any number of takedowns or throws with the sticks or disarms. I can take the knife away from him and use the knife on him. What I want it to be able to do, again, is use the effective distance of the stick. I can also stay outside that distance. Instead of closing in, I might just stay out here and just continue to beat on that arm until that's out of the question or out of the picture. And it'll probably be out of the picture after the second or third strike. After I take this out, smash, smash. At this point, I can start going to the head, take out the legs, do whatever I need to. Okay, the environments that a knife fighting or a knife fighting technique or uh, knife fighting might be employed are obviously a close quarter battle situation. Uh, primary weapon goes down, I need to access a secondary weapon. Another environment would be uh, some kind of sentry stock, sentry neutralization situation, I would need a knife. Uh, unexpected situation. I might be, uh, as a uh, SEAL team typically operates in uh, close proximity to the enemy. Uh, they go deep into enemy territory and uh, I might need to de deploy my knife at a, at a moment's notice in that environment. You can use any sort of improvised weapon. Some of you may have collapsible PR-24s, collapsible batons. Even if you just have a short stick, same concept can hold true. If he strikes, I can smash the hand, take the hand out of the picture, then move in with the butt strike. Same thing, even if I can expand this weapon, as he attacks, I can strike here, then bring the baton out, smash, 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 lock, and whatever else I want to do using the baton. Again, I can use non-lethal force, I can go into various chokes, throws, or if I need to use more force, I can do that. The mindset that uh, is important for any kind of engagement, whether it be uh, knife fighting or otherwise, but we'll talk about knife fighting, is that number one, I need to have a calm awareness of what I'm doing. I need to understand the principles I'm dealing with. I need to go to, I need to fully understand them, uh, work with them, train uh, on a constant basis, and uh, I need to uh, practice in a, in, and work and work out in a realistic environment. So the mindset is gonna, again, it's gonna take a commitment uh, to learn the skill. It's not a skill that's learned overnight. Uh, you can't just pick up an edge weapon and become proficient with it. It, it takes time, it takes a, a methodical approach, and it takes dedication to learn how to do that. The last type of defense against a knife and the one that you want to avoid at all costs, if at all possible, because it gives you the least chance of survival or winning, is empty hand against a knife. If you're in a situation you have absolutely no choice, then you have to make the best of it that you can. Use the exact same principles that we've gone over with the, the uh, knife against knife, stick against knife, whatever it's been. We've talked about distancing, we've talked about timing, we've talked about angles of attack, we've talked about the different targets. We've talked about when you make contact with that hand, you want to, with the knife hand, you want to maintain contact. Where target becomes very important, not just in what you're striking, it's critical in terms of the target that you protect, is as a, you're going to get cut. If you're in a knife fight, chances are you're going to get cut regardless. You go empty hand against a knife, you're almost definitely going to get cut. And you, you need to prepare for that mentally uh, so you don't go into mental shock when you first see blood splurting. The idea is not to get cut, the idea is to survive. I'm going to have to give him a target when he comes in. What you see sometimes, he goes to my midsection, people jump back like this, and I may be moving this target, but I'm giving him a little bit higher, I'm giving him my chest. I have to give them something less than that. We talked about the back side of the arms, or the parts of the body, probably the least vulnerable. Uh, arms, we talked about on the inside, there are a lot of uh, structural and functional targets that you want to protect, as well as uh, vascular and systemic targets. Back and hand, if you're going to take a cut, is where you want to take your cut. Another advantage the back of the arms give you, if he's coming to my midsection, if I have to give him something, by definition, when I bring this arm in, my arm is also protecting the central part of my body. As I said, that might not be lethal right away, but it'll probably be lethal in the long run. So by using the backs of my arms to deflect rather than grabbing, I give him uh, the least vulnerable target. SEAL Team is an environment of constant change. Um, combative concepts, um, our training cadre is in a, in a state of constant change. We're willing to look at all different types of systems and evaluate them break them down to their, their components and look at them and, and weigh them up against the mission. And we get our ideas and principles from all different uh, uh, competent individuals, people that have uh, studied in the field in, in the Filipino martial arts and the Japanese martial arts, uh, jiu-jitsu uh, systems. 
there's, there's many elements that are common, and there's a common threads through, through many of them in terms of principle. Uh, specific techniques may apply in different situations. So we, in a sense, we beg, borrow, and steal uh, and integrate them into a package. If I try and grab or push his hand away, we had talked about from his point of view, that's an ideal target. If he cuts the hand itself, I can't close that hand. I may use complete loss of that hand. If I don't lose uh, complete use of it, it becomes bloodied. I can't grip onto anything. If he cuts the fingers, the tendons in the fingers, uh, I use, uh, lose the use of the hand. So it's not a good thing to try and grab the knife. I'll try and use, again, the back of my arm, and I'll try and deflect. I'm trying to sidestep either to the outside and starting to close the distance in. Again, this is his uh, best zone for the knife. I'm going to get to the outside. I need to close in the distance. At this point, if I'm in a position and I feel comfortable locking, I can do any sort of locks. I can bring the knife back to him. I can use his own knife on him if need be. At the very least, if I get inside here, I don't want to lose contact with the knife. I don't necessarily have to get a lock on it. Even if I'm just here, if I strike somehow to distract him, I may drop on his leg, strike back to the head, take him into some sort of throw, and then take the knife back. I don't want to lose contact. What happens if you do lose contact, I come in with his first attack. Here, I let him pull the knife away. Even though I don't get cut, he's going to get me the second time. So from that initial contact, I don't want to lose it. He goes to pull back here, I stick with him. I jam him up. At this point, again, I can be striking. You're dropping down on his leg, somehow distracting him with elbows, other sorts of strikes. Then I can cut the way I want, lock him up if need be, restrain him, whatever is necessary. Uh, throughout my experience in training and trying to set up scenarios that are realistic, uh, we often employ uh, the, the aggressor with, with edged weapons, uh, training weapons. And it's amazing what you see in there. It's amazing the lack of awareness of, uh, uh, of, the, of the threat in general. We see guys uh, come in with four, five, six guys all with, with weapons uh, raised, ready to go. And after analyzing the scenario, it was clear that uh, two or three, sometimes all of them, uh, suffered lethal or serious injuries uh, due to an edge weapon. One individual or two individuals in there with edge weapons that had a commitment to use them. One last piece about defending empty hand. When you deflect, and I can't go the other way, he strikes. Even if I end up reaching across, still using the back of my hand, I may not be able to always go after that knife arm. I want to distract him. So maintaining contact, I may come in and strike. He still has a knife. This is just going to be for a split second, whatever my strikes are. I don't, at this point, when he's dazed and damaged, at that point, I might take the knife out. And I'm still trapping his leg. I may want to use a knife at that point. Continually want to be striking and attacking. Knives are basically used for three things in combat with other human beings. Stabbing, slashing, chopping. Some knives are designed to primarily chop. Some knives are designed to primarily stab. Most knives have a, at least a stabbing, slashing capability of some sort. And the design of the blade um, determines the qualities that that, that knife will have and, and to what degree they'll have it. All knives are compromised of some sort or another. No knife can cover every base 100%. This is an antique Japanese design, about nine inches long. Japanese differentially tempered their blades. So the edge is very hard, and you can probably see here a firing line that differentiates the very hard martensite edge from the perlite body of the blade. Truzite and sorbite crystals make this cloudy formation right here. This particular blade has um, a relief on the spine of the blade, on the mune. And that allows a couple of things. It allows the blade to penetrate easier. There's not so much metal to move through. It also allows for the blade to slash a little better because, again, there's less metal here to be drugged through the flesh. And you'll find that many knives have, uh, antique, ancient knives especially, people that lived and died by their use on a daily basis, you'll find many of these features. I prefer a single-edged knife. 
Okay, I always know where the edge is. If I apply it along the forearm, which is most frequent for our style, I can apply pressure through the bone of the forearm, put my hips behind it, and know that I'm not going to be cut in return. Okay, this knife by Cold Steel is uh, typical of many modern combat knives. Um, it's a clip point knife. Clip point allows it to penetrate easier. Generally speaking, the point will be pretty much down the middle of the handle. This is a flat ground knife from all the way from the, the back or spine of the knife. Japanese will call it a mune. It's flat ground all the way to the edge, so there's not much resistance here. It gives it a good ability to slash for its size. There's not very much steel in the way to cause resistance. And slashing is very important. Generally, slashes are used more than stabs, and they can be more debilitating than stabs used properly. When we're doing a room entry and there's a need to access the weapon and control or throw somebody, this is where we're holding it most of the time. If we want to turn and stab with it, it's easy to do. This is a larger knife, not generally used by military personnel, but certainly um, a time-honored design going all the way back to the Vikings and becoming um, in many forms uh, famous from the use of Jim Bowie. Uh, it has a clip point again. Uh, it has a flat grind, very substantial spine. Um, really a very, very strong, strong cutting, serviceable, serviceable blade. Some of them have serrations along the back to help them to cut through everything from the uh, aluminum used in helicopters to thin sheet metal. Uh, this also has a clip point. It has a very substantial handle. One of the advantages of a knife like this is the fact that pommel strikes are very effective with this. Some people like the firmness of the grip here. Other people would like to be able to move the knife around a little easier. This one is a little awkward that way, but yet the grip is very secure, hard to lose it. It's become very common uh, in naval special warfare and other military special forces to carry some of the modern combat folders, clip knives, many, many makers. This is a bench made. Um, it is a very sturdy knife. It has uh, what's become called the Japanese chisel point. Uh, this is a very strong cutting point. It's a good slashing, good cutting point. It's a very strong, serviceable folder. Um, may be used as a defense, last resort defense weapon. Has many other uses, uh, especially when cutting away gear, uh, your meal, whatever, it, whatever might, you might need for a small knife that's not as unwieldy as some of the larger knives that you might carry. This particular folder by Benchmade has a grind that will penetrate quite easily. So its ability to penetrate or stab is pretty good. Blade's relatively thin, and it's a flat grind. Slashing ability's not bad. Again, you understand with a small blade like this, slashing ability is not going to compare to a larger blade. But still, you have some fairly significant uh, slashing ability here and good penetrating ability in this particular blade. It's light, it's easy to carry. Um, one hand use is relatively easy. I think it's interesting to note on most of the modern combat knives, unlike your dad's K-Bar um, from World War II, the absence of what is misnamed a blood gutter or blood groove. You'll find that there's no benefit to a blood groove for suction created by a stab in a wound. Another interesting thing to me about some of these old wives' tale, which span many com uh, continents, if you insert this thing deeply and the muscle spasms around it, you have an extremely sharp edge on one side. It would be relatively easy to press down and withdraw that knife by cutting its way out. But certainly, there's not enough grip by muscle on a flat edge like this to hold it in to any great degree. You may have to apply a little more pressure depending upon, but a blood groove is not going to allow the blood to flow out and that type of suction created. Uh, it's a muscle spasm that causes that, and having grooves in the blade doesn't, doesn't benefit you at all from that standpoint. This is another Japanese design. It's an unmounted blade. Fairly long Tanto design. This one is a very good compromise between the three uses of the knife. As you can see, the point will penetrate quite well. Not quite as well as one a blade designed specifically for penetration, but quite well. 
It also slashed very well. You see the curve of the blade? See how it moves? Okay, this blade's going to slash very well. It will chop reasonably well also. Not quite, not quite as well as the Bowie design, but it'll still chop relatively well. So this was a good compromise, okay, again, between the three main uses of, a, of an edged weapon. Since the commissioning of the United States Navy SEALs by President Kennedy for the purpose of operations in the Vietnam conflict, Navy SEALs have enjoyed the reputation of being among the best trained combatants in the world. This reputation has been deservedly gained through the highly effective and innovative employment of weapons and tactics wrought from intensive training. In this modern, high-tech world of electronic weapons, computers, and an almost obsessive attention to equipment selection, one must be mindful of potentially falling into the trap of believing all is secure. The foundational operating system, the man himself, must be carefully examined and evaluated. The mind, the body and spirit are inseparable components that must be trained to act in unison when faced with life-threatening situations. In order to maintain peak operational readiness, the Navy SEALs are continually pursuing the most effective strategies, techniques, and training methods available. Combative Concepts Incorporated is leading the way in dynamic, realistic, and practical weapons and tactics training. Founded by former Naval Special Warfare members David Maynard and Ken Good, Combative Concepts Incorporated offers training in a wide variety of areas, including close quarters battle, high power rifle and sniper operations, unarmed and knife combat. Combative Concepts offers varying levels of firearms and tactical training for military, law enforcement, and security groups, as well as authorized civilian individuals. The mindset for this course and this type of training is that you want to provide a platform or a medium for force-on-force -force training. Now, the problem is you, you come into my house, threaten my daughter, or my son, or my wife, I'm not going to be in a real friendly mind. I'm going to hunt you down and blow you away, period. If you are interested in training with Combative Concepts, contact the Enrollment Coordinator at 1-800-836-9848.